Um, this person says, I've been naturally bodybuilding since the age of 18. I'm now 31 years old. I was wondering at what age do men start getting lower testosterone? Is it, is it typically mid-20s or is it a male um, uh, that has been bodybuilding naturally for his entire life? Keep going at his level. Are they, lo are they higher? Um, uh, and... Uh, are they, are, they, are, they, are they higher level or longer? So if someone's doing bodybuilding naturally for many years, does he have better chance to keep his, his natural level higher or longer? I think the question is, and, and, uh, and also when usually typically it starts going down. Well, the first part of the question about when yeah. does what, at what testosterone age? Yeah. typically start to decrease? Right. It depends on which study you read, of course, but generally speaking, I think it's accepted that around about 30 years old, your testosterone naturally starts to decline I believe the estimate is about 1% a year, oh. but that's so varied, and okay. um, I mean, that's part of what makes medicine fun. Everybody's different, and I know that sounds like a, a, an escape from the question, but it really isn't. You have to take each individual separately and look at the numbers. I think we talked a little bit about this last week. It's not just numbers. They have to have the symptoms, so right. um, I, I don't mean to, again, avoid the question, so technically... I think the answer is, again, depending on what study you read, 1% a year after age 30, but... So on paper, that's usually what Yeah, but more importantly, you know, the symptoms can occur any time. A lot of the symptoms are brought on by stress. I think that's a big factor mm. that we haven't studied enough of. Um, you know, there's you stress, the kind that's good for you, like going to the gym and working out, and there's mm -hmm. the, the bad stress where you're worried about the, the you know, 2.3 kids getting <laughs> yeah. to college and, yeah. The, yeah, the mortgage payment and all yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah that drives the testosterone down for sure. That's a good point. That's um, a good, so, the, so the earlier you start stressing, the more chance you have for your test to go down the tube earlier on. Yeah, absolutely. Now, that having been said, I've seen people with low testosterone in their late 20s. I think the record I have without an actual disease process going on is 27. Oh my God. Uh, wow. But I see guys in their late 50s. I want to say the record I have is uh, 59 that still have very high levels of total and free testosterone. Those are both extremes. That's interesting. That's interesting. And I've always thought for some reason in my head, 35 was when everything was starting to go downhill, but it could be or younger. In so. my experience, I tell people roughly at 35, <laughs> you, you things too? start to go south. Okay. And, and a lot of people come in at 35 wondering what's going on. Gotcha. The problem is if stress is a big factor, uh, well, obviously, I can't tell people well, just stop stressing. That's that puts more stress on them than before. And the issue becomes: okay, well, you know, you can move to an island and uh, you know, say your or do your yoga on a daily basis and your mantras and whatnot, and maybe get your test levels back up for what the next five years. Yeah. And then you're more likely to be naturally, if you will, uh, in need of testosterone replacement therapy. Um, so, you know, it's a catch-22. Are you, is that practical? Heck no. You know, we live in Los Angeles here anyway and yeah. in, in, in a different world. Highly um, stressed environment. So, yeah, yeah exactly. it's, it's practically speaking, that's about when it occurs is age 35 that I see clinically. Okay. And so would you, as far as natural bodybuilding is concerned versus enhanced, do you say that these guys that have been bodybuilding natural all their life and they are in early 30s or mid 30s have a higher chance to have higher tests? Uh, naturally than uh, the other enhancer? Well, that's that. another interesting question because the, the myth, if you will, is that, first of all, athletes have higher levels of testosterone. Um, that could be true, but what I see mostly these days, and it probably goes into that stress, I was talking about the pressure to achieve, it's so much more competitive these days, uh, yes. most of the athletes overtrain. And so they actually have lower levels of testosterone. They do and much, in the yeah. sports that involve mm -hmm. endurance, uh, it doesn't necessarily reflect in their performance because, um, and this isn't to be taken the wrong way, but certainly females have lower levels of testosterone, mm -hmm. and yet they can compete in endurance sports without a problem. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, I, I see low testosterone often in, in athletes, particularly who overtrain, but in terms of the natural versus not natural. Mm -hmm. Certainly when you're using replacement therapy and you go off of replacement therapy, there will be a period at which you're, uh, during which your testosterone is lower. It's usually gotcha. for about three months and you know, your pituitary kicks back in. And gotcha. You're, you're, really that's not the hard part. The test schools take a little bit longer to kick in. Um, 
and you'll have temporarily lower levels of testosterone. But for those guys that cycled, when, particularly when they were younger, typically mm -hmm. before age 26, when you're still developing, sometimes that will, for the rest of your life, uh, lower your testosterone levels overall because I see. you haven't been fully developed while, wow. um, while taking a replacement. You know, even if you're good at cycling and faking the body out, you might go for uh, 12 weeks and before your testosterone levels uh, completely shut down or shut down for that long, um, you know, you go off of your testosterone cycle or in a lot of cases, obviously steroid cycles. Um, and uh, you know, you can bounce back, but um, again, while you're developing, uh, there's a lot of chance for permanent damage. And that's what's important. Horrible, yeah, no, but it's important. It's important to say that. Okay, very cool. Very All right, Doc. Okay, question number two, I asked the doc, what are the signs of low T? I guess this person says we didn't cover that enough last time. Um, and, um, okay, is there any um, anything that we should try first before HRT? And do you know any good doctor in Oklahoma? <laughs> <laughs> So any well, sign of low T, I can start with the last part uh, okay. quickly. No, I don't know any doctors in uh, Oklahoma, okay. but you know these days it's worth a shot with your primary care physician because uh, you know awareness of low testosterone is increasing. So it's worth a chance, and you can always, if if the you know, if you can find a good doctor, they should be he or she should be open to studying this. If they haven't already, you can bring information to the doc and. If they are not already up to snuff, you can educate them and hopefully get something going in with your local doc. <laughs> and it's not, I know we're laughing because of Oklahoma, but no, it's, it really, it should be everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but I know we have a lot more uh, fitness oriented people here right. than in Oklahoma. And we're going to get letters from Oklahoma now, but you know, obviously different lifestyles and whatnot. So yeah. it's not meant to be. I guess it's not a big deal to talk about that in Cali. It seems like, you know, every other person you talk to, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah a yeah. lot of people move here yeah. because of Holly Weird, all that stuff. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we don't mean to be. Uh, putting down Oklahoma, but I, I get the point of okay. his question, I hope, and, and uh, he gets mine. Um, so signs of low T. Signs of low T are pretty easy. Lack of energy, lack of libido, uh, lack of a general sense of just well-being and joie de vivre. Mm. Um, someone can be depressed if they have low testosterone. Someone can uh, complain of uh, what typically comes out as fogginess in thinking. Um, sleep, I think you mentioned. Before. Sleep is also an issue because of that lack of sense of well-being. People mm. will will sleep for the first four-hour cycle, and then when they have enough energy to start worrying again, they will, and the wheels start turning at two or three in the morning. Whenever a guy will typically get up to to urinate, um, and uh, they can't go back to sleep because uh, they just don't feel like, hey, I can conquer that. Remember when you were sixteen? If you got up in the middle of the night to to urinate. Uh, your brain started going that direction. You say, "Ah, shut up! I'll handle it in the morning." Because you were superhuman back then. You had yeah. that sense of, "Hey, I can do anything." Yeah, yeah. So those are typical signs. Plus, change of body composition. Gotcha. There's a reason why guys are using testosterone in athletics because we know that it helps support the creation of muscle. Ana mm -hmm. Anabolism is important. So guys tend to start getting uh, more fat and um, uh, losing some of the muscle, which of course is, comes hand in hand. Yeah, and you're not too happy when that happens, <laughs> which <laughs> creates <absolutely>. stress. <laughs> it's all it's all connected. It's a downward spiral. Right? <laughs> um, okay, and then um, what was the second part of the question? I don't remember. So, is there anything? Oh, is there anything to try first before someone may consider a homeowner? Do you have anything to? Well, other than trying to reduce stress, like we talked about. Yeah. Um, I think he's talking if about. If someone's younger, I will look to. Well, first of all, we have to rule out a, a problem. Right, which is fairly rare, but it, it has shown up several times in my practice. You could have a, a pituitary adenoma or a microadenoma, something that interferes with the signal from the pituitary uh, to the testicles, the the, uh, the luteinizing hormone that the pituitary would would be uh, creating, and that happens in in uh, we expect to, to well, we want to check that excuse me in younger people because for a myriad of reasons. Obviously, you don't want to start replacement therapy if we have another answer to the problem. Mm. And if someone is uh, younger than 30 years old at least, I will investigate that avenue first through an MRI and, and rule out something uh, blocking. And, and by the way, it's a it's typically a non-cancerous. It's a benign tumor, but mm. it is something that gets in the way, obviously. Mm. And it's an easy surgery. Easy surgery. They're all 
surgeries, but relatively easy to go up through the roof of the mouth, typically, and remove the tumor, and normal functions restored. Mm. But um, in guys older than 30, um, there aren't a whole lot of things we can do uh, because the testicles just don't respond. Uh, I can go into a lot of different reasons as to why I think that is, evolution being part of it. I mean, well, I will. 200 years ago, uh, the, or 300 years ago, the life expectancy average was about 28 years old. Wow. What's the purpose of having functional testicles if um, you know, pr procreation is not an, uh, on the table, if you will? Right. Um, if you didn't have a child by the time you were 14, 15, um, wow. it wasn't going to make it, right? Wow. If, if, that's if you made it to typical average life expectancy. Yeah. So um, anyway, bottom line is we would have tried, and we do, again, if someone's young enough where we think the testicles respond and we've confirmed that it's an issue of the pituitary not functioning rather than the testicles not functioning, we'll use human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, HCG, which is an analog of LH, uh, luteinizing hormone, to get those testicles to work. Otherwise... Um, we find in clinical practice that HCG just doesn't bring up the the level of production enough to make a clinical difference. So we go straight to replacement therapy. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a good one. It's actually from an older gentleman uh, who's actually uh, out of state as well. This one is from another country. And he says, uh, for a guy around 50 who's in decent shape like a gentleman. I'm 52. <laughs> he said, for a guy around 50 who's in decent shape like a doc himself, uh, with 100 milligrams of testo gel a day, which is the test gel, you know, in those little uh, amp thing uh, pack, um, normally be a good dose to feel like 30 again. And he says in parentheses, only 10% gets absorbed via the skin. So what, what do you think about that? Um, 100 milligrams of a gel is not going to do the trick. No. No. Um, I used to have the farm reps come around here and we all got a good chuckle until we got tired of listening to the same jokes every, every time they came visiting because uh, we all know it just doesn't work. Um, it's, I don't know if it's mainstream medicine's way of dipping their toe in the water, but um, you'd have to bathe in those you know, androgels and test stems to get enough testosterone in your system. And it's all borne out by labs. I mean, you can see, oftentimes, oftentimes I've seen guys that were using Testim or Androgel. And we see their initial labs, they'll have low T to begin with. And then if I ask them to not apply their gel before they, you know, if they normally do it in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, before they do their labs, um, you'll see that their testosterone is now lower than it was before they started quote unquote therapy. Why? It, it sort of acts like uh, like birth control does, where you give your body enough of the substance, the hormone, that it fakes it out if you will to say, oh, well, we don't have to produce any on our own, oh. yet it only lasts for a short while. And guys that are naive to any other forms of therapy will think, oh, wow, I feel much better, relatively speaking, for a few hours anyway. Um, but there's a reason why you have to apply it every day because it's metabolized and your levels will drop back down again. And again, the effect is overall you might feel good for a few hours, but over a 24-hour period, you end up with a lower testosterone level than when you started. Oh, so and 100 milligrams is not going to do the trick. If you got to 200 milligrams, um, you could probably get away with, uh, not probably, definitely get away with the, the daily routine depending on what kind of transdermal absorber you are, meaning how much of it you can absorb through the skin. He wants 10%. 10%. I don't know where he got that from, but do you agree with that? Or? Uh, maybe that's the average, but okay. again, everybody's different. I've seen it vary by a factor of about 10. Uh, some people, I've had them apply it double the typical dose twice a day, and because they're not absorbing through the skin, the, the levels don't bear out a, a significant absorption. So. Um, that again goes down to individual differences, uh, but in general, 100, 100 milligrams is not going to do the trick. I've never, that's just not enough. Okay. So that, that, that question B of the same question, he was like, well, give me the pros and cons, injection versus the, we kind of just, you just answered it right there. I mean, well, pretty much. Yeah, so. I mean, there's a huge difference clinically speaking between the two. Um, and that's why I used to sort of ride the fence and, I've said I'm a registered libertarian, but uh, you know I, I wouldn't try and give out my personal bias about using a gel or cream versus uh, an injectable. But 
I just see so much more benefit with injections clinically that I, I can't bite my tongue anymore. And I really encourage most of my patients to use, even the women uh, now, to use the injectable because, as I said, there's a reason why you have to use the cream every day. Your levels are going up and down, up and down. Well, of course, sir, yeah. And, you know, just real quickly, let's, let's eliminate that argument about, well, that's more natural. Who cares? First of all, again, none of this is natural. It's right. natural to get sick and die one day. So <laughs> I love that who cares one. about natural? <laughs> right. um, clinically, people who, you know, when you're doing this on a weekly basis, you're going to have a peak hmm. if you're using Cipionate roughly two and a half days and then a tail. And so your levels will be high for the entire week and you'll feel better. Hmm. And sometimes people will say, well, wait a minute, you know, I know this is going to give me energy. I don't want to be energized all the time. Well, it's not like coffee. So we, we got to be careful we're not confusing the two. Mm. It's just the potential to have energy and, of course, feeling better all the time with levels that are consistently higher rather than variable as much as they are day-to-day uh, -day with the cream. I see, I see. Okay, so you were saying if you want to build some real muscle, how much of wheat do you think is good? Five hundred milligrams. You can answer that by saying, I mean, at this point, it's just more to feel good. I mean, do you think they can actually use those gels to actually build muscle like you would with the injectable? Probably not. Definitely not. Again, for the same reasons. Okay. And, and there are studies that go back to the '60s. I think one of which is 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 uh, listed on my my, my nerdy website. But um, it was written by Jerry Brainham, by the way, um, uh, showing that unless we got levels to at least 800 serum, um, we weren't going to see the clinical results. And and that's borne out in in my practice watching people. Uh, if you're going to do this, you have to do it to get to a high normal level. Mm. Uh, to answer his question, uh, 500 milligrams of testosterone a week. Uh, With, I'm not through sure. gel. Yeah, I mean, is that yeah. you're taking two days off or a ton of day? That, that, that certainly would yeah. not be advisable or more no. of that work to build muscle. Yeah. Um, to some degree, uh, the more the better, but there is a point at which you're going to definitely get diminishing returns. There's only so many receptors, etc. There are some studies showing that, um, and, and there aren't a lot because this isn't something we study in, in Western medicine now. There might be some in some Eastern European journals, uh, and not necessarily the Eastern European journals of bad science. I mean, there's some real studies out there, but there aren't a whole lot showing that uh, as much as 600 milligrams of testosterone in injectable form, like Cipionate, mm -hmm. um, is actually better for you than, say, 200. Really? Again, what's better, depending on what markers? But most of us agree that you know better to have more muscle. That's a uh, you know synonymous with more metabolism, if you will, higher metabolism, and therefore um, all kinds of good benefits that we all know about. But um, you know you're not going to see that in our country being practiced anytime in probably in our lifetime mm -hmm. because it goes far outside the standard of care. And 200 milligrams a week of testosterone cipionate. Again, everybody's different, but yep. you know underneath that Gaussian curve, we're we're hitting 95 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, works very, very well to keep a, a mean uh, uh, high normal level of testosterone. And I mean, because of you, ha you have the swings, right. you know, the mean is what you look at. And again, clinically, people are, are doing very well with that without any negative side effects. Uh, as far as that goes, not a question he ans uh, asked, but to answer, what are the side effects that are possible? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, typically, we look out for an elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit. Acne? Uh, acne could be an issue, uh, but that's not really because of testosterone. That's because of what testosterone can get converted into, something mm. called dihydrotestosterone. Gotcha. Um, uh, but, again, the elevated uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit is usually not a secondary to um, a disease process, per se, or the excess testosterone directly. It's usually because someone suffering from either um, sleep apnea or they, they heavily snore and therefore their oxygen saturation during their sleep goes down enough so that essentially they're training in their sleep so mm. uh, you're creating a demand to create more red blood cells, more hemoglobin, things that carry oxygen in the system. Mm. Um, and of course the, the major one that we look out for is the elevated estrogen levels because estrogen is made from testosterone so uh, whether you're using um, you know, 100 milligrams uh, of uh, test gel or 200 milligrams or 600 milligrams uh, a week of testosterone cipionate, uh, the, the, the fly in the ointment is 
estrogen. Estrogen is what causes the water retention, the fat retention, the uh, moodiness and irascibility, and it activates the genes, all of which we have, or all of us carry, um, for prostate cancer. So what would you say is the best thing to take to avoid that, to avoid having too much estrogen for a guy? To well, my favorite, uh, because I think it's the most elegant way of doing it, is to use an aromatase inhibitor, uh, because that way you're, you're sparing the very thing you're trying to replace, testosterone, mm -hmm. by not letting it convert into estrogen. Uh, it's converted in the liver by this, this uh, aromatase enzyme, and we just block that enzyme, and we can limit pretty easily and pretty precisely the amount of estrogen we produce. So what would you prescribe then? What, what is that, what's that the called? The brand is a Remedex. The, oh, that's the, the best. So that's the one you like. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So that's the one you like the most. we can block the receptor, but then we're still <clears throat> something like um, tamoxifen, but then we're still uh, creating the estrogen. And so your testosterone level is going to drop. I see. Uh, estrogen is going to be free floating. And I'm not sure that we, I mean, you never know. We might not have identified all the estrogen receptors out there. And there may be a mechanism by which something's uh, not being blocked, who knows? It's just, as I said, it's, it's so much simpler, and to me more, uh, maybe elegance not the right word, but just uh, it seems more intelligent to, to do it by blocking yeah. the conversion to begin with. Yeah, that's great. All right, thank you, Doc. Um, I want to expand a little bit on the last question, Doc, because I think the reason why people are asking about angel gel and all those, you know, those alternate way of getting tests, uh, aside from injections, because they're just... They're so afraid of the needle, and they just uh, they just don't want to go there. So I think that last question was basically, please tell me test gel is good. <laughs> please tell me I can use it. Sorry, it's man. just as good. And so I think you'll be disappointed. So what do you have to say to the patient that come to you and say, please don't tell me I have to shoot myself. I don't want to use needle. What do you what can you tell them to make them feel First better? First thing is don't shoot the messenger. But. Um, <laughs> Every, yeah, everyone white knuckles it the first time. I don't care how macho you are because since we're this high, nobody likes needles, right? But, right. Uh, I tell people I, I was an accountant uh, long before I was a doctor, so I'm honest and conservative as the day is long, right? Uh, no one, once they uh, get around to shooting themselves with a needle, um, uh, says, oh my God, I can't do that anymore. Or, wow, that hurt. In fact, everyone says, wow, that was it? That was nothing. So I really have just a handful of, of patients using the cream versus injection because I really push for it uh, because of the clinical benefits. Um, but um, what, what was the other part? You're talking about the cost, you know, the, the fact oh, that, right. you know. The other factor is it's so much cheaper and uh, so much less of a headache. With creams, you have to apply them every day and you have to remember, hey, I'm going to Vegas for the weekend. Uh, if you forget it, then you're four days without bring, your cream. Bring my stash. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, just, it's just a hassle. Plus, uh, you know, I mean, the practical parts of it, to be very frank, you know, guys uh, meet a girl that, again, going back to Vegas, and they don't feel comfortable bringing the cream with them, having to hide it in the bathroom or whatever. You know, if they've already done their shot for the, for the weekend, they don't have to worry about that sort of thing. Um, but uh, also the cost, practically speaking, is a huge difference. The creams, um, I don't know what the non-compounded versions like Androgel and, and Testim actually cost, but I know they're expensive. I've heard estimates of you know hundreds of dollars a month uh, I don't know uh, that, that's without the copay but even the copay I think you pay a, a, a good amount whereas um, of course depending on where you go uh, you can get uh, testosterone sipionate or the the injectable therapy to which I refer including your anastrozole and, and everything for less than a hundred dollars a month including uh, anastrozole why yeah. wow so there's no reason why you you're, you're stuck with uh, this, the, the, the test and the androgels, you know, because of, of price, certainly. Gotcha. Thank you, Doc.